Hi everyone. Oops, shaky, shaky. Um, if you haven't seen it already, my uh, last quickie video on past, present, and future. Uh, I I highly recommend that you watch that. It's a brief one, uh, but um, this and I don't want to go into it here, of course, and repeat myself. But um, as I'm sure you you realize already, uh, past lifetimes, future lifetimes, this lifetime, past, present, and future, are constantly referred to throughout Buddhist uh, teachings, literature, uh, and in uh, Nichiren, it's no different. Uh, and as I dive deeper into this um, opening of the Eyes Go Show, which now will start to get very, uh, <clears throat> very descriptive of the place of the Lotus Sutra and the historical teachings, uh, past, present, and future will be discussed many times. And it can get, you know, as, as I uh, entered Buddhism, I already was very much of the mind that this whole idea of previous lives, future lives, that kind of thing, was just nonsense. But as it's in everything you read in Buddhism, it's very, it, it can be very confusing. And it actually became an obstacle to my uh, study. And I just, I was so repulsed by the idea that every time it came up, and it comes up a lot in Buddhist writings, uh, part of me just went, mm. you know, like when you don't like a certain food and it keeps showing up on your plate. <laughs> it's like, mm, that again. And uh, I had to be careful that my my uh, reticence about that term didn't keep me from getting the gist of what was being discussed. Uh, you know, in Buddhism, we're looking for meaning. We're not don't want to get too hung up on the specific words because that'll be an obstacle just like this lifetimes lifetime future past present kind of thing and it took a long time many years of study for me to finally settle into a, why is this here why does this keep coming up why doesn't somebody correct this right um and there are many early sects of buddhism still to this day talking about reincarnation which isn't buddhism at all uh, even as a term that's that's a, a vestige of uh, certain brands of hinduism and uh, and other things um but apart from the rhetoric the just the language of it the idea of it still lingers right well i finally figured that out uh, some years ago and uh, and i just tried to encapsulate it in a short video past present future that I just did, uh, and I'll post probably this, both of them at the same time. So uh, anyway, uh, if you have any struggles with that whole concept, which probably all of us do, uh, I invite you to watch that video. It's not going to be end all be all. I've talked about this before in different ways. As my clarity and enlightenment continues to grow and expand, I will have new rhetoric and new ways of explaining. Hopefully this recent one is helpful. I'm sure I'll do it again uh, because it's so consistent. Or maybe I'll move on to something else that will appear to me to be in need of some discussion. Who knows? Anyway, for right now, uh, I think that one might be helpful. If you're already resolved on uh, all of that time thing happening within our own minds, then um, gladly skip along with me. But I want to share everything I can with you. So here we go. Continuing, it is also laid down that one should, quote, rely on the sutras that are complete and final and not those that are not complete and final, end quote. We must therefore look carefully among the sutras to determine which are complete and final and which are not, and put our resolute mind of determination in the former. Bodhisattva Nagarjuna, in his commentary on the Ten Stages Sutras, states, do not rely on treatises that distort the sutras. Rely on those that are resolute to the sutras. The great teacher Tendai says, quote, That which accords with the sutras is to be written down and made available. 
but put no resolute mind in anything that in word or meaning fails to do so. So again, here we're, we're uh, reminded that when we uh, read the sutras, commentaries on the sutras and so forth, to seek the meaning in them and not get hung up on the specific words. This is a trap. The words are a trap. They're a trap for our human minds because we like to attach ourselves to ideas and concepts without... It's ironic because as we're Buddhists, as we get older, we're always trying to understand the bigger picture, quote unquote. But we try to do so with a lot of things that we're adhering to that lead us astray. So it's a conundrum of sorts, isn't it? The great teacher Dengyo says, quote, depend upon the preachings of the Buddha and do not put resolute mind in traditions handed down orally. An another bit of a conundrum, but I think you know what it means, right? Enchin, also known as the great teacher Chisho, says, quote, in transmitting the teachings, rely on the written words of the sutras, end quote. And I think that's an important one to, to discuss because all of this, uh, these comments that you hear about writing things down um, and teaching and so forth, they all come from a statement read in the Lotus Sutra as well as other sutras that in order to be an adherent, a, a, a practitioner of Buddhism correctly, is to read, copy, write, disseminate this teaching. It's repeated in many, in several sutras, certainly in the Lotus Sutra. Okay, so that's what all of this is uh, talking about. When, when you hear transmitting the teachings, the written words of, um, this is what uh, we're talking about. To be sure, the leaders of the various schools whose opinions I have quoted above all appear to base themselves on some groups of sutras and treatises in attempting to establish which teachings are the most superior. But these men all cling firmly to the doctrines of their own school and perpetuate the erroneous views handed down from their predecessors, so that their judgments are characterized by, their, by twisted interpretations and personal feelings. Their doctrines are no more than private opinions that have been dressed up and glorified. So what Nietzsche is saying here is even though they say these things rhetorically to follow uh, the Buddha's sutras only and not other stories handed down orally or in writing, which wasn't said, they are guilty of doing exactly that. So see, how, Nietzsche is pointing out how insipid this problem is. This is why there are so many sects of Buddhism. There really should only be one, the teaching of Buddha. So why are there so many sects? It's because of these private opinions. And they propagate opinions based on their superiority. So our school is better than their school. Da, 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 da. We see this in everything in human life, right? The ego creeps in. The greed keeps creeping in, right? It's capitalism, capitalism of the mind. Follow me. You should be following your own Buddha nature. But who wants to say that? Where's the profit in that, right? Whether it's monetary or, or simply um, ego. Think about that. The non-Buddhist schools of such men as Vatsa and Vaipulya, which appeared in India after the Buddha's passing, are even more wrong in their views and more cunning in their doctrines that their counterparts before the Buddha, because they borrowed ideas from Buddhism. Similarly, since the introduction of Buddhism to China in the later Han Dynasty, non-Buddhist views and writings have become even more wrong and cunning than their pre-Buddhist writings of Confucianism that deal with the three sovereigns and five emperors of antiquity. Why does he say this? Because once the truth is known, for you to adhere to things that may have worked in the past, um, if you continue to propagate those fallacies, then you're doing so in the face of obvious truth. Right? We see this today in politics, all over the place. Is that Even though it's an obvious falsehood, now that the truth is known, 
They continue pounding it into our minds. Like that's going to make it true again. It's the same thing in Buddhism, in the history of Buddhism, right? In everything. Also, the teachers of the flower garland, Dharma characteristics, true word, and other schools, jealous of the correct doctrines of the Tendai school, brazenly interpret the words of the true sutra in such a way that they will accord with the provisional teachings. Same problem stated another way. When the truth is undeniable, the best, the best thing you can do if you want to f move people back toward your own incorrect teachings is to use the very words of the truth in service to your falsehood. And these con men. Those who seek the way, however, should reject such one-sided views, transcending disputes between one's own school and others, and should not treat others with contempt. Mm. Because ultimately, even though they do this, if you recognize that they do this, they're part of the human samsaric drama, drama, aren't they? In a way, they reinforce, even though th through their own perversion, they reinforce the truth because they obviate it so glaringly. In the Lotus Sutra, the Buddha says, quote, Among the sutras I have preached, now preach, and will preach, or teach, this Lotus Sutra is the most difficult to believe and the most difficult to understand. It's difficult in the face of all the previous statements that seem to be the last word, right? Also, it's difficult to understand simply because of the profundity, the, the amount of study it takes to gain the capacity to actually understand the meaning of the essential chapters of the Lotus Sutra. Is, is, it's daunting. It takes effort. You don't just hear it and go, aha, now I know. No, now you know after you've studied all this other stuff to get you to the point where knowing is knowing, where knowing becomes clarity and you see the ladder of logic, the, the, the slow penetration of the mental experience and what's actually going on in your mind, right? This is the way it is with opinion in general, right? We hold opinions dear as, as fact until enough time passes that we've questioned our own understanding of that fact and then finally come to a much clearer understanding, even to the point of rejecting everything we have used to say was absolute. It's kind of the human experience, isn't it? So this is the same in Buddhism. Until you study enough, and this takes a will to, to do so. It's, it's, I'm sure you know people who hold an opinion far too long and you can see it in their eyes that they're on shaky ground but they don't have anything to replace it so they staunchly at attach themselves to it and espouse it even though they know there's something wrong with what they're saying they don't have the will they don't have the courage to investigate their own thoughts and maybe adjust them it may just be ego once i've said this i can't retract it because i'll look stupid well, you look stupid because you're adhering to something that you yourself know is incorrect. But what are you going to do? They, they are a punctuation mark on what the actual truth is, aren't they? It's just sad that they don't want to let themselves know more or go beyond that flawed opinion, whatever it is. So here it is in Buddhism. This is what Nietzsche is talking about. Miao Lo remarks, quote, Though other sutras may call themselves the king among sutras, there is none that announces itself as foremost among all the sutras preached in the past, now being preached, or to be preached in the future, end quote. He also says, quote, Concerning the Buddha's statement that this wonderful sutra surpasses all of those of past, present, and future, there are those who persist in going astray. Thus, they commit the grave fault of slandering the sutra and for many long kalpas are subjected to sufferings. So, what, is, what does that mean? Again, that sounds, you know, I was raised Catholic. Uh, like most in the West, I have this very uh, uh, spiritual, philosophical, religious leaning that says that um, 
you know, you, you're slandering something so that um, now you'll suffer for a long period of time. And again, this past, present, future is coming into play. Understand that when this is discussed in the, in the, the Buddhist canon, that what is meant is the the man I was just, or person I was just describing that knows they're saying an untruth or at very least an unsupported truth. It isn't a truth at all, but they continue doing so for egotistical reasons or for whatever their reasons are. Um, they are internally, they are suffering. They know they're, they're being deceitful or, or, um, or, or lazy or whatever. They, they're torturing themselves with this thing they're adhering to. They refuse to grow beyond it. They refuse to look at what's actually going on. This is suffering. In Buddhism, this is the core of suffering. It's self-causal. We do it to ourselves. So it's not a future life it's, or any of that. It's about, well, our future in this life it's our life experience. And if Buddhism is about nothing else, it's about having a clear, wonderful, life-embracing life experience in this life, here and now. So this is what the rhetoric always revol resolves and revolves around, okay? So, let's see where we are here. I can't see my screen, sorry. Okay, I've got some time. Startled by these passages in the sutra and its commentaries, I examined the entire body of sutras and expositions and commentaries of the various teachers and found that my doubts and suspicions melted away. But now those foolish true word priests rely upon their mudras and mantras and believe that the true word school is superior to the Lotus Sutra simply because the great teacher Jikaku and their other teachers have assured them that the true word school is superior. Their views are not worthy of discussion. So you see the theme here, right? Mudras and madras, for those of you who might not know, are hand positions and uh, words. You might even say chants. They're, they're mantras. They're things you say. Okay, mudras, mantras hand positions, body positions, okay? The Secret Solemnity Sutra says, quote, The ten stages, flower garland, kimnara king great tree, woo, supernatural powers, srimala, and the other sutras, all derive from this sutra. Thus, the Secret Solemnity Sutra is the greatest of all sutras, end quote. So, you see here, here's another school saying that our sutra, because all of the sutras come from it, is the superior sutra. So there is an actual reordering of uh, the, the periods of study, the periods of teachings, uh, uh, conveniently, because they all revolve around the same concepts. They manipulate the, the words of these sutras to uh, reorder their by superiority which one is supreme. The Great Cloud Sutra states, This sutra is the wheel-turning king among all sutras. Why is this? Because it is the sutra set forth, uh, that set forth the doctrine of the cons consistency, woo, my words today, consistency of the Buddha nature as the true nature of all beings. Well, this is a constant theme, so it's not just the Great Cloud Sutra that mentions it, but it's convenient to say that and then claim superiority there, isn't it? The Six Paramitra Sutra says, quote, All the correct teachings expounded by the countless Buddhas of the past and the 84,000 wonderful teachings that I have now expounded may as a whole be divided into five categories. First, Sutras, the Buddha's teachings. Second, Vinyana, Vinaya, monastic rules, third, Abhidharma, treatises, fourth, Prajna Paramitra, the <coughs> Paramita, the teachings of the perfection of wisdom, and fifth, Dharani, wonderful and difficult to understand formulas. The works in these five collections will instruct sentient beings, 
Among sentient beings, there may be those who cannot accept and abide by the sutras, vinayas, abhidharma, and prajna paramita, or there may be sentient beings who commit various evil acts, such as the four major offenses, or the eight major offenses, or the five cardinal sins, that lead to the hell of incessant suffering, or slander the correct and equal sutras, or are ichantikas, who disbelieve Buddhism itself. In order to wipe out such crimes, give quick release to the offenders, and allow them to enter the, into nirvana at once, I preached for the sake of this collection of dharanis okay this is offenses is talking about karmic offenses and again it's about what we do to ourselves there's no karmic police out there all right and these are the five divisions of buddhism in case you were wondering quote these five divisions of the dharma are compared to the five flavors of milk cream curdled milk butter and ghee respectively with ghee as the finest the division, that's clarified butter in case you were wondering. The division containing the dharanis compares to the ghee. Ghee has the finest and most subtle flavor among the five substances enumerated above and is capable of curing various sicknesses and easing the minds and bodies of sentient beings. Similarly, the dharani division stands foremost among the five divisions of the teachings because it can do away with the grave offenses. Um, alter alter previous karma, right? Which we understand is a persistent perfe uh, perception in our minds. I'm going to keep coming to that because it can be easily confusing when reading this rhetoric. Um, again, the, the sicknesses are not actual sicknesses. They're sickness, sicknesses of our perceptions in the mind. The Profound Secret Sutra states, quote, at that time, Bodhisattva superlative truth appearing addressed the Buddha, saying, quote, World honored one, in the first period of the teaching, when you were in the forest, forest sage ascetics gathering, or deer park in Varanasi, for the sake of those who wished merely to seek the vehicle of the voice hearers, you expounded the doctrine of the four noble truths, in this way turning the wheel of the correct law. This was a very wonderful thing, a very rare thing. No heavenly or human being in any of the countless worlds had ever been able to expound such a doctrine as this before. Yet the wheel of the law that you turned at that time left room for improvement, left room for doubt. It was not yet final in meaning and offered ample opportunity for dispute. This was the Hinayana period. It's often labeled that way. These are the early teachings that were disseminated from the Buddha's uh, lectures. Quote, Then, world honored one, in the second period of your teaching, for the sake of those who wished merely to seek the great vehicle, you taught that the, all phenomena are without distinctive natures of their own, that there is no birth or death, that all things are basically in a state of quietude, and that the nature of beings, as they exist, constitutes nirvana. You turned the wheel of the correct law, although you did not reveal the whole truth. This was even more wonderful, an even rarer thing. But the wheel of the law that you turned at that time left room for improvement, left room for doubt. It was not yet final in meaning and offered ample opportunity for dispute. So this is the second period of the Buddhist teachings. And rightfully so, he taught some very critical things and many uh, late Hinayana or early Mahayana teachings seized upon those teachings, and this is where all of these other schools get their opinions about being superior. Well, it's, it's some of the reasons. Now, quote, World Honored One, in the third period of your teaching, for the sake of those who wish to practice the vehicle that saves all beings, more the Bodhisattva style, you taught that all phenomena are without distinctive natures, that there is no birth or death, that all things are basically in the state of quietude, and that the nature of beings as they exist constitutes nirvana. And then you have taught that the nature, quote-unquote, you spoke of, itself lacks anything that can be called a nature. You have turned the wheel of the correct law and expounded these doctrines in their perfect form. This is most wonderful, the rarest thing of all. 
This wheel of the law that you have turned leaves no room for improvement, no room for doubt. It is truly complete and final in meaning and offers no opportunity to dispute. Again, this is an earlier teaching. So even then, they were settling their place in the level of the third period of Buddhist teachings. And it's true. The, the nature of nature. This is a concept that, that can be very elusive. And you can see now, as the Buddhist teachings mount on top of one another, how it's critical to have an open enough perception to start to get or understand these these concepts because they get they can make your mind kind of swirl around itself they, and uh, and a lot of times you can just walk right past them and it won't be until sometime later maybe years later after study that you'll come to understand the nature of nature and that there is no nature and that's the nature of nature because it's about this cross understanding of what this human mental life is versus what the fundamental enlightened experience is. There's this bridge to cross and um, it's very profound. It takes a lot of time to get there. So uh, I keep worrying about running out of time here and I'm sorry I have to keep checking my clock. Yeah, we're there. All right, well, I'll have to continue after I bobble this camera around. Sorry about that. Um, because now we're going, Nichiren's going to get in how the, the words, getting caught in the words is a bit of a trap in our human minds, and he's going to try to move beyond it. But that's a, a, big, that's a big chunk to understand. So review this nature of nature thing, this, this building up of, uh, of uh, these different uh, periods of the Buddhist teachings and how different, pro uh, not prophets, different teachers, different bodhisattva, different uh, proponents at different times. Uh, basically, we're just lauding the Buddha for certain things he was teaching, but that entire schools took off with that and made themselves the center of the world instead of understanding that they were in a process, a pro progressive process to take them to an ultimate truth that's far easier to attain than the machinations they were going through, but they didn't understand that yet. They couldn't understand that yet. So we will continue in the next one. Uh, don't forget to check out uh, that short video I did on past, present, and future. And uh, I'll see you in the next one. Thank you so much. Namu myoho renge kyo. Be well. Um, and I'll see you soon. Bye.